The town of Christiansburg, Virginia, population nearly 22,000 people, is located in the southwestern part of the state in a region known as the New River Valley. So tell us about this pretty old car I just looked at and took some video footage of. Well, it's a 65 mile new wagon. It's restored and ground up. A place with a Kmart parking lot sees much more than just weekend shopping. What is that that we have a picture of? It's a 1972 Chevelle. Pro Street Chevelle. Uh, Dewey. How long have you had your car? I, I bought it. Some of the cars are driven in, some were hauled in. I am now videotaping you. I'm, I'm going to watch you ride out. You take care and have a great day. It's a place where a freight train barreling through town is business as usual, and there are more engines you saw to find. The longer before you see the end. Go on the kids. Wow. <laughs> Pretty much, I took my camera everywhere, even when I went shopping. Who would have thought that you go to AutoZone to find, shall we say, Paris the Hilton right there in front of the right government? In a natural habitat, crikey. Oh, are you doing there, Paris? Where's your little dog at? I don't see him in the back there. Where's he at? How much of a horsepower? 40 horsepower. Though I'd rather this story be about unicorns and rainbows, this is a story that must be told, and it is only now, after a judge retired, before it could be told. And the good people of Christiansburg and the surrounding New River Valley will likely find this story shocking. This is what only barely a handful of people even knew about. In October 2013, I filed a civil suit against Do North Ventures, the parent company to Automaster Tire and Service. And most people were completely unaware of the trial that was held on December the 18th, 2014 in courtroom 4A in the Montgomery County Courthouse or of the jury's verdict in that trial. In Virginia, there is no statute of limitations in felony crime, and on December 15, 2016, I filed a criminal complaint with the Christiansburg Police Department. Investigators must now determine, did the late John Arthur Corrig conspire with his son-in-law, Rob Fain, to fabricate a defense? Rob Fain now owns Fain Tire and Auto in Christiansburg. The evidence presented to investigators shows that this man, Anthony Collins, made a claim that is humanly impossible. Collins has also joined fame at his repair shop. Investigators will see the letter this man wrote in 2011, which directly contradicted his client and his client's witnesses and their testimony during the trial. Phillips will have to explain how he didn't recognize the differences in his client's claims. Colin R. Gibb will have to explain why in the May 21st, 2015 hearing, he said he would narrow down the statement of facts to what he felt the Supreme Court justices needed to see. Questions will be asked about the juror Kyle Loudermilk who was spotted in the common area hallway while the trial remained in session and he was without the bailiff. Steve Alley of DNM Used Auto Parts will have to explain his claim of never locating a serial number on the alleged used engine he claimed his business sold to Automaster. They'll see that the first complaint was filed with the Better Business Bureau and then to the Office of Consumer Affairs, and finally, the complaint was filed with the circuit court. Investigators will see the motion for reconsideration and the attachments I provided with it to the judge. They'll see the judge's denial, and they'll also see the 40-page petition that I'd filed with the Supreme Court, as well as the 13 attachments.
petition filed with the Supreme Court, there's a section for the statement of facts. That statement of facts had to be isolated to the events that took place within the trial only. Investigators will see there were four errors I asked the Supreme Court to consider and to decide if the verdict should have been overturned and the complaint remanded. Two different claims sworn under oath. Jury given authority over proceedings of the trial. Juror alone and unaccompanied in common area. Verdict unsupported by rule of law and evidence. Investigators will see the 39-page statement of facts and 26 attachments that were filed with the trial court. The statement of facts filed with the trial court was not isolated to only the events of the trial, but it was permitted to giving background. I realized that for the justices to look at my case, one of the things that was important is to know who the person is that was asking them to consider overturning that verdict. In a second set of interrogatories, Due North Ventures was confronted with the letter that was written on November the 23rd, 2011. In that letter, it reads, to the best of defendant's knowledge and belief, none of the facts recited in the letter are untrue. Investigators see that on the first set of interrogatories, there is no mention of the installation of new will lug nuts or will studs. They'll see that the claim that Anthony Collins by himself installed a used engine, new exhaust and intake manifold gaskets, new turn signal, new left and right front axles, and a new blemished battery. They will compare that to the second set of interrogatories and the letter dated the 23rd of November 2011. They'll see that the description of a battery is different as well as the date in which they claim that the battery was installed. Free of charge does not cause a quote to become higher than any budget. Investigators will find that on Anthony Collins' payroll spreadsheet, he performed three services. You'll see my name and invoice number right around the center on the 19th of September. Once this information is compared to the invoices from O'Reilly and Napa, which show that the axles and CV boots were purchased on September the 19th, 2011. One question might be asked, how could the jury, the judge, Mr. Phillips, none of them, how could they not see the blatant discrepancy in facts? Investigators will be able to review the statement of facts that were filed with the trial court. Since there was no court reporter, the statement of facts substituted as the transcript. Investigators will also be able to see the hand-delivered letter that Mr. Phillips delivered to the judge chambers. And they'll also see that Phillips filed 13 objections to the statement of facts with the court clerk. And though filing the objections with the court would have ensured a hearing would have taken place, Phillips asked the court if the court felt that a hearing or a meeting should be held on the matter. The 13 objections that Bruce T. Phillips filed did not raise any claim of anything erroneous or incomplete in the statement of fact. 
the only authority the judge had in modifying the written statement of facts was to make corrections. Bruce T. Phillips of Phillips Law cited Rule 511G to raise his objections, but he asked the court to recognize the objection under his rationale. The transcript of that hearing will show that I asked the judge to overrule all 13 objections because none alleged any claim was erroneous or incomplete. The transcript also reveals how it was pointed out that rationale is not recognized nor conforms to the rules Philip cited. And investigators will see how Judge Gibb pushed back on the motion to overrule the objection. Judge Gibb made it clear that it was up to him and at the top of page 12 of the transcript, Gibbs said, It is still my prerogative what the statement of facts are. And though he addressed my expert witness as a good expert, Gibbs referred to the case as both parties went to trial with theories. And on page 42 lines 19 through 21 of the transcript, Judge Gibbs said, I am actually probably going to use your statement of facts to make a statement of facts. What some might consider the smoking gun just may in fact warrant federal investigators to get involved in this investigation. Only the judge and bailiff had access to the evidence and manila folders that were given to the jury. A huge thick vanilla folder with photos and documents that my attorney gave to the bailiff at the end of the trial have never made it down to the record nor did the seven manila folders which contained the evidence introduced at trial and was given to the jury the judge has never provided a ruling nor is it even known what he did with the statement of facts Today is November the 1st, 2011. Uh, time now, 12, 19, almost 20 after 12. I'm making this video uh, because I need to demonstrate what has now happened to me a second time. Uh, my truck here, uh, last night, Halloween night, uh, don't know exactly the time. I went out to a grocery store, or rather a gas station and touched um, probably less than a mile and a half as I was coming back and I'm going to point that out as I was driving back uh, at the corner of the street here that leads in front of the house just trying the corner uh, some kind of blowing sound in the motor and the truck is now dead. Wayne L. Jones, a former military and city police officer, testified to his findings. He told the jury that the engine had not been replaced in my vehicle nor the other repairs Automaster claimed to have performed on my vehicle. Why is it that a man so well qualified was so easily ignored or not convincing? Bacoric, Fain, Collins, and even Phillips told the jury that the nuts and bolts in the photos would not show tool marks because the motor had been installed from underneath the frame of the vehicle. And at the same time, each one of them admitted that they were not licensed or certified mechanics. I've had some say to me, you should have just sold your truck or some would say Phil you should have just let it go and move on with your life being diagnosed with MS has its own challenges and for the most part I stayed in front of it my neurologist said I was likely a slow progressor and he felt that I was healthy enough to follow through with the plan that I had with an old army buddy of mine 
we were going to go over the road together. He was going to be my driver trainer. We had plans to even go into business together. My relapse was stress induced and medical records support that. And the root of that stress was fighting auto masters, lies and denial. Being deemed permanently and totally disabled at age 48 was devastating for me. They took something that I can never get back. Why? Why haven't I given up? It's personal. Investigators will have to figure out what happened, what actually happened during that trial. The evidence shows Due North Ventures had Bruce T. Phillips of Phillips Law PLC hand deliver a letter asking Judge Gibb to reject the statement of facts. Was it a coincidence that during the jury selection, Phillips chose Kyle Loudermilk? What are the odds that the lone, unaccompanied juror would also end up as the foreman? What does the bailiff know about the missing folders? And how did that juror get away from well, him? Well, we're going to have to get your flashlight at mm -hmm. home. Yeah. Uh, that, that is on the plate there. It's on the upper part of the plate. You may have to put some oil on your fingers and rub it across there. Right. I, I just don't know, but that that's that's the block plate that has the number on it. Wow, well, thank you. And man. it is there. Wow. How will Bruce T. Phillips explain how neither he or his client or Stephen Alley or anyone from DNM used auto parts could find the serial number on a 2200 RE engine in 2014? Although. In 2011, and in his letter, Boosty Phillips said that he had records and photos of the serial number. Investigators now know that Phillips hand delivered a letter from Do North Ventures to the judge to his chamber asking the judge to reject the statement of facts. What needs to be known now is what did Phillips and Gibb talk about during their private meeting? And most importantly, was there more than just that letter Phillips gave to the judge? Give him a kiss. Oh. <laughs> That's what makes my day. You understand that why I'm out here. This you can't beat this. This is real and unedited. And he said, you can go fast.